With your permission, we start our uh, second uh, session that uh, will deal with the regional implication and of these uh, developments in Iran and regional and beyond the region. We have with, with us uh, five very distinguished uh, scholars uh, that uh, the one thing that they have in common is that they are all somehow uh, affiliated with the uh, London-based uh, uh, Institute of International Strategic St Studies, and they have, been, they have been here for a conference that organized or meeting uh, with the, the, the annual dialogue with, the, with our own INSS. So I'm very pleased that they have been here and they agreed to join and speak with us. But in terms of their areas of expertise and, and uh, background, there are, uh, there, there are five different personalities. I begin from the uh, way it was uh, presented to me and just uh, introduce them. We have Professor Shahram Chubin, a senior associate in the Carnegie Non-Proliferation Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Uh, he's best in Geneva and he's, he focuses on non-proliferation, terrorism, and Middle East security, and I know him best for many years as a scholar of the Gulf, Persian Gulf and Iran in the Persian, in the, in the Persian Gulf. Uh, then we have uh, Stephen Simon, who is a Sabak Senior Fellow for Middle Eastern Studies at the Council of Foreign Relations, based in Washington, D.C., I believe. Uh, and Goldman Sachs, a visiting professor in public policy at Princeton University. Uh, before moving to Britain in 1999, uh, he, was, he served at the White House for over five years as Director of, for Global Issues and Senior Director for International Threats. Uh, then we have Dr. Uh, uh, Dana Alin, is a Senior Fellow of, for U.S. Foreign Policy and U.S. and Transatlantic Affairs. Is, uh, Editor of Survival and Senior Fellow for Transatlantic Affairs at the International Institute of Strategic Studies in, in London. Uh, next is uh, Dr. Toby Dodge. Uh, is, uh, n is known to me at least, and I think his main field of studies is he's Mr. Iraq in many ways. Uh, Iraq's changed, but the scholars remain st studying different <laughs> aspects of the life of the Iraqis. He's a consulting senior fellow at the Middle East, for the Middle East at the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London. He's an expert of Iraq, Iraq as I mentioned, but inter also international relations of the post-colonial world and comparative politics, comparative politics of Middle East. Finally, uh, Professor uh, Steve Miller, in the first session, we had uh, one guest who had been with us in, October, in, in May, Professor Orkad, and now we have also another one who made all the way from Boston, Cambridge, uh, to uh, Massachusetts to, to be with us today, Professor Stephen uh, Miller, Director of International Security Program and member of the Board of Belfer Center for Science for sciences and international affairs. Now, with smart people like you, you can Google each of them. You will find information about them more than they, more than they want you to know about them, I believe. Uh, I, before going on, just because our guests, uh, most of them, or all of them have been in, the, uh, in another conference uh, when we had our first session, we discussed in the first session the internal situation in, in Iran, and f few issues have been raised, and I think that uh, also making, making some link between uh, the domestic and, uh, and the regional and the foreign relation. What struck me is that uh, uh, I studied Iranian Iran history before the Islamic Revolution, and I was fascinated to see the first generation of Iranians who were educated under the Shah studying that the Shah was great and Iranian secularism is wonderful and modernization is the right path to success, they revolted against the Shah and established, helped to establish the Islamic Republic. Thirty years after, we see the children of the Islamic Revolution, students who have been educated under the schools all their life, the schools of, of uh, the Islamic Republic, going uh, to the other side. As someone who has 
devoted much of his time studying educational system, I long uh, came to this conclusion that in education and propaganda, we can put, put in the mind of, if you can put in, in textbooks whatever we please. We cannot control what gets into the mind of the people. And I think that the Iranian experience is fascinating in the change in all different, different directions. One point that I want to bring to this session from the previous one, since you have not been here, a lot has been, or so there was some discussion about the Obama syndrome and the influence of the emergence of President Obama uh, in, on the Iranian youth. Now, this, uh, the name uh, Barack Hussein Obama is a, is, has a wonderful meaning for Iranians. Barak is barake, is bracha, is blessing in, in Persian and Arabic. Hussein, there is no better name except maybe Ali, his father, <laughs> that is uh, being for the Iranians. And Obama, the way it, the, the name is written in Persian, it means he is with us. If the Obama is in Persian means he is with us, and there were slogans in Iran when he just became, he was a candidate, say, Obama asked, he is with us. When he offered the dialogue and he went on in his campaign, at least the official Tehran came with another slogan, Obama Nist, he is not with us. And the question is with whom he is, and I don't think it's very clear, but I think that there is something interesting in in what's going on between Iranian president, Iranian uh, politics and American presidents. And I dis was discussing it with my students for a long time. Somehow, wherever, whenever there is an, you know, people who go to election, they vote for the destiny of their own nation at the best of time, if they have the right to vote and to decide. I think when Americans go to vote, they decide also for other peoples. Now, whenever there was an, uh, American Democrat president putting human rights high on his agenda, there was some kind of revolution in Iran. <laughs> the first time it was in 1951 when Obama, oh, sorry, when Harry Truman was president and Mossadegh emerged and took power for at least temporarily in Iran. Then in 1961, Khomeini became national hero Strangely enough, the president was Kennedy. In 1978, there was a big revolution, and the president was Carter. And I think that it's not coincidence that this youth movement emerged when Obama has been elected, because the spirit of Obama, his emergence to power, gave new heart to the people, it is at least my understanding, to the people of Iran, that, uh, that we, yes, we, can, we, we too can make it. By the way, this, the slogan, yes, we can, was the slogan of, of uh, Ahmadinejad in 2005. It's, uh, maybe Obama uh, borrowed it from Ahmadinejad. It was, the, the copyright, is, as far as I know, is Ahmadinejad. He said, Mishavad lo mitavonim, it's possible, and yes, we can make it. And, uh, and I think that the way he came to power, elected, gave really hope for the people of Iran uh, that they too can make a, dif a, a, a difference. Whether or not uh, America is now supportive or can support or Europe is doing anything to really help uh, the Iranian youth or is it possible at all to, be, to help, and this was an issue of discussion in the first panel, if the, if the outside world can influence domestic uh, scene is uh, remain to be seen. But I, what I would suggest is that we organize this, this uh, uh, conference as a round table that we, uh, I, kn I know we, it's such a big punishment for professors, mainly you're traveling from long distance, to ask them to speak it up to 10 minutes. Uh, it's all like, like, like torturing people. Uh, but we ask them to speak up to 10 minutes so we'll have more time for discussion. And uh, I will uh, ask uh, maybe, maybe to begin with people from, from you, Sharon, it's okay, because you deal more, more close, you and uh, Toby deal more with a very close neighborhood. Okay, thank you very much. I'll dispense with the formalities. Thank you, David. I'm very glad to be back in Israel and uh, to be addressing you on this subject. Um, I'm going to try and make five points. That gives me two minutes per point. First point is, 
the tendency in, in Israel and uh, the United States, especially U.S. statesmen who speak to friendly crowds and say that they've been looking for that elusive species, the Iranian moderate, for 20 years and haven't found him. Well, recent events suggest to me that there is an Iranian moderate out there, and there are quite a few. And the notion that there's no difference who gets elected in Iran to Iran's foreign policy is false. First proposition. Second proposition, foreign policy actually figured in the election to, to quite considerable extent. If I'm not mistaken, David can correct me, it hasn't been a, a subject before. In the presidential debates, which of course were, were unprecedented, uh, they came up, and they came up in very clear terms, that people were saying that they wanted to have a decent, uh, Iran to have a decent respect for other people's opinions and to have a decent uh, role in the international community, including in the immediate region. And uh, th these were not so uh, subtle uh, attacks that suggest that one day the issue of foreign policy actually may come down to the Iranian street. In other words, that there will be an Iranian street involved in foreign affairs. The reason I make this point simply is that it's, it's basically been an elite issue characterized by slogans, and which has been manipulated. Uh, nobody has really gotten into a discussion of it. And now, I think for the first time, people have said, hey, what are we doing? What are the costs? Is this really in our interest? And it reflects, I think, a difference between those who want a revolutionary interest pursued and those who want a national interest pursued. Third proposition, foreign policy and domestic politics. Domestic politics in Iran, uh, as they've been and as they are now, very much depend on uh, one element. Let's say, let me put it bluntly. The revolutionary elements in Iran, the hardliners in Iran, use foreign policy to legitimize themselves. The notion that there's an, an outside world that's dangerous, that the revolution is embattled, that Iran should have a revolutionary duty to help oppressed people, and that this is all part of the revolution's identity, is an essential ingredient in the platform of the hardliners. But by definition, the others have a different view. Um, third, Foreign, third, I, I didn't mention this before, I'll say it very briefly. Under Khatami, to get back to the notion there are no moderates, under Khatami there were attempts to change policies. S some were successful. In the Gulf there was some success. In normalization with the EU there was some success after the Salman Rushdie affair was, was settled. But it, as relation, relates to the Arab-Israeli issue, the Palestinian issue, and as it relates to uh, uh, the nuclear program, which continued on the Khatami period, there was no change because Khatami, I think primarily, was not able to control all elements in the government. The Khatami period shows us one very clear thing, which is the hardliners control the hard security issues and that they were fighting a game, they were fighting the, uh, uh, the reformists, whatever you want to call them, the other side, without any rules at all. They in indulged in a series of policies that included uh, impeachment, uh, jailing, uh, assassination attempts on Hajarian notably, uh, uh, spoiler tactics on policies in, to do with the Middle East, and so on and so forth, and, and probably not telling Khatami what was going on in the nuclear program. So the hardliners were playing for keeps, and I think that the, the recent election shows very clearly that the hardliners or the people who are now coming out strongest in the country weren't willing to accept the possibility of any sort of electoral, electoral uh, what should I say, not electoral victory to the other side, but not even a fair election in which one side would, would win 50% or 51% and the other would win 45%. This would have been too dangerous for them, and I think that they decided to rig the election in such a spectacular way as to brook no opposition, as I think Khamenei said, it's definitive, and that's that. Uh, they are going to marginalize the, the, the moderates and uh, eliminate them politically, if not physically. Um, so it leads me to the, to the fifth point, which is, uh, and Khamenei made it very clear where he stands on this on June the 19th, when he said that basically, that if you had to choose between the Rafsanjani view of, of, on uh, foreign affairs, social, cultural, and economic issues, and the Ahmadinejad view, his position, Ahmadinejad's position, was closer to that of the supreme leader. Made a very definitive statement. Now, how much change are you going to have on foreign policy? 
uh, it seems to me most unlikely that the regime, having done what they've done to eliminate these people and whose base depends on this mobilized, aware, vigilant, revolutionary presence, forward defense. I could talk at length and won't about the Middle East and how much it, it would be different under a different group. But I think the policy of Ahmadinejad in the Middle East in this part of the world has been a forward policy, an active policy, and it's been animated by strategic considerations, a strategic asset in, in fighting the, the American-imposed order, the Pax Americana, as somebody was saying earlier on. Um, that's quite different from the notion in the past that support for Palestine was a discretionary political decision, not a strategic one and not one that was inevitable um, uh, uh, and, and necessary part of, of Iran's foreign policy, but a discretionary political one. So I think it makes a lot of difference, and I think on the nuclear issue as well, you're going to see a continuity of the program, particularly because uh, the critics pointed out the costs of this program in terms of Iran's standing of the world uh, and, and, and hinted at a willingness to see if there was space for reassuring the international community on the program while maintaining Iran's program, peaceful program. These, these characters since 2005 have shown they have absolutely no interest in reassuring the international community. They've, they've, they've uh, stood firm and they've gained lots of concessions and they've rejected or not answered two sets of packages which were considered uh, packages that included inducements. So I see very little chance, I'd like to be corrected, very little chance of change on the hardline foreign policy in the next four or five years of this president than, than in the previous five years. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon, and uh, to Bobby. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm uh, more than happy to use my first minute to, to thank uh, David Manashri uh, for inviting me to Tel Aviv University, which is uh, especially uh, important because uh, Ofra Bengio, uh, Yossi Costina, and, and Yoaf Alon are uh, probably, along with David, four of my most formative and long-running academic friends, so it's great to be uh, where they're teaching. Now, what I uh, want to do is give you two visions of Iran's influence in Iraq and, and then uh, tell you where I think uh, it's going after what's happened over the last couple of weeks. I think the first is this, this idea that I think uh, the Americans have in the past in Iraq f f uh, f fallen prey to, which is the, the, the omnipresent Iran. Iran is the, the, the hidden hand behind all that's gone wrong, it's, it's shaping the terrain and will inherit the earth once the Americans have gone home. Now, there's a, there's a great deal of truth to this. It, it, it's, it's set up a series of, of quite effective clandestine networks in the 1980s, which, along with their partner at the time, Dawa, managed to kill some quite senior Ba'athists in southern Iraq. It formed a, what's now called the Islamic Supreme Council of Iraq, one of the main parties in Iraq. It formed it in 82 at the height of the Iranian Revolution as a vehicle for Iranian foreign policy. Uh, Iski um, was until uh, the elections at the beginning of the year one of the main parties dominating the government and the Bada Brigade, Iski's militia, uh, militia that was in, at least until it returned to Iraq in 2003, um, officer corps by the Revolutionary Guard, was one of the main forces perpetrating sectarian violence in Iraq through to 2007. Again then in 2004, uh, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard helped form the so-called special groups of Jaysh al-Mahdi, Muqtad al-Sadr's militia, um, set up three uh, training camps near Tehran and were responsible for transshipping a great deal of arms and munitions, especially the 240-millimeter uh, rockets that I suffered under last year in Iraq, so, so, um, into Iraq to make the, the, the targeting of American soldiers much more effective. And you could say this reached its peak in Kabbalah in, in January 2007 when five Americans were, were killed by what's called the, the Kazali network run by Kaysal Kazali, uh, a guy very close to um, uh, Iran re recently at least. And I think this reaches its peak with uh, David Ignatius's um, article about the, the head of uh, the Al-Quds Brigade of the Revolutionary Guard, uh, Soleimani, uh, uh, who he called the... Uh, the point of the Iranian spear inserted into um, American armor in Iraq. And so Soleimani was responsible, allegedly, for uh, getting Maliki, the premiership, in, uh, in, in the spring of 2006. But I think more interestingly, negotiating the ceasefire after Maliki launched the charge of the Knights 
against Jaysh al-Makdi uh, forces in Basra in April. Certainly, he rang up President Talibani, the president of a sovereign state, and demanded that he meet him at the border, telling him to tell his American friends not to bomb the building that they were meeting in because they'd kill the president of Iraq as well as uh, Soleimani, uh, Brigadier, uh, the Brigadier General of the uh, Quds Brigade. So clearly, I think there is a strong argument to say that Iran has a great deal of influence in Iraq, and this could continue, in, in, in fact, increase as American troops shrink their size. But of course, there are certain problems to this, empirical as well as analytical. Firstly, if there are these thousands of Iranian operatives in Iraq, how come the Americans have only arrested five of them? And if Hezbollah are this proxy uh, for the uh, Iranians, how come they've only arrested one Lebanese guy, uh, Dadouk, with uh, the Kazali brothers? I mean, if the Iranians are omnipresent, they're also invisible or very clever because they never manage to get caught. I think the second vision, the second analytical approach to this, I think is much more interesting. And it's, a, it's of, a, of a, a mediated, balanced presence, which has great limits, and is quite frequently rejected. And I'll give you 2007 as an example of that, as a case study of that. At the end of 2007, there was a clear drop in the weapons coming across the Iran-Iraq border. Uh, there was a clear drop of support for Jaysh al-Mahdi and the Badr Brigade and those trying to kill American soldiers. Now, why would that be? I think the first thing was that from September 2007 onwards, uh, in the dying days of the Bush presidency, both Bush and Vice President Cheney started to shift the, the trigger, the causes belly for an attack on Iran from proliferation, which was a long way away and very hard to prove, to the evidence they had that Iranians were directly involved in killing American soldiers, which they thought would be a much better way to, 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 to convince the American population. The Iranian government, I would argue, detected that very clearly and took their foot off the accelerator, moved back and, and, and shifted away from uh, military confrontation by proxy. Secondly, and I think even more interestingly, the Iraqi Prime Minister uh, al-Maliki in August 2007 went to Iran. Now, under the omnipresent thesis, this is an Iranian uh, proxy, a stooge, a paid-for actor. In his meeting with uh, Khamenei, he says to Khamenei, according to Maliki's press spokesman, you have friends in the, Iranian gov in the Iraqi government. Either support them or support the people you're also supporting who are undermining the government. Make your mind up. Make a choice, basically, between Sada and those de deploying violence or us in government. Then thirdly, quite intriguingly, the two main violent clients of the Iranians in Iraq, the Jaysh al-Makhdi and the Badr Brigade, in August 2007, the, their, their kind of internal rivalry reached a peak where there was an outright um, a clash in the holy city of Najaf. Some people were killed, and that then triggered Muqtada al-Sadr going on a kind of permanent ceasefire of Jaysh al-Mahdi. I think the Iranians again looked into the Iraqi abyss, as it were, and saw two of their main clients actually killing each other and stepped back. And I think finally, and most indicative of the limits of Iranian power in Iraq, and we can possibly generalize this across the region, is the election results, the provincial election results. The Supreme Council, the Islamic Supreme Council of Iraq, and the provincial elections were beaten, were whooped, were absolutely decimated at the polls. Why? I think they, had, they saw their uh, provincial election results halved, quartered, reduced to nothing because they were seen as an Iranian client. They were seen as a sectarian party, largely responsible for the civil war that dominated Iraq from 2005 onwards, and they were rejected by the Iraqi population, newly mobilized around a nationalism, for want of a better word, personified in Maliki's retaking of Basra the previous year. So I think if we're looking now, if we're looking at Iranian foreign policy after the debacle of these elections, I'm sorry not to be in, in the earlier um, earlier seminar, but I think uh, the, the, the Green Revolution won't be a revolution, it would be a green result, it's not a green revolt, which may well be quite easily suppressed, I suspect, because of its lack of organizational capacity. However, I think the aftermath of that may well be a much smaller 
more coherent, more radical ruling elite in Iran, but I suspect their ability uh, to, to, to control, to dominate, to use Iraq as an arena to beat the Americans with in anything short of a direct military strike on Iran will be limited. And it will be limited because of the things that I mentioned. Iraqi nationalism, Iraqi Shia or Iraqi first, and a long way down the list, Shia when it comes to confronting neighbors like Iran. Secondly, that their proxies, personified by the Prime Minister, are growing autonomous and independent. And thirdly, because I think at, at periods in, in, in the violent civil war, the, the, the Iraqis are asked to choose between the devil they knew, ironically, the American occupation and the devil they didn't, Iranian intervention, and the Iranians got an increasing amount of blame for that violence, the devil that they know American presence is shrinking. I don't think it'll ever go away, but it's shrinking and it's over the horizon or out of the cities by the end of this month. And I think that will constrain, if not annihilate, Iranian um, influence in Iraq. So I think Iraq highlights both the, the pinnacle of Iranian influence in the region, but its limitations, and I think those limitations have increasingly constrained what Iran can do, even in its next door neighbor with a Shia majority. Thank you. Now, I think that from more, more from this region, I give now to more wider scope, and maybe we uh, begin with here with Mr. Stephen Simon. Uh, thank you, David. I'd like to take the first 10 minutes to thank you for inviting us, <laughs> and then uh, wrap up with some uh, shattering conclusions. Uh, the uh, The, uh, the, the, the question I wanted to, um, uh, to take up uh, uh, here in this panel was, um, was about how Washington uh, sees uh, this. And it's a very important uh, issue for a few reasons, uh, not least of which uh, that President Obama had made um, engagement uh, with Iran a priority for his foreign policy. It was, um, uh, in fact, that was showcased uh, in, his, uh, in his foreign policy. And for Israelis, of course, it's hugely important because of the nuclear question and because of perceptions that uh, there is a kind of a wide um, offensive, Iranian offensive, uh, being staged in Lebanon on the one hand uh, via Hezbollah and uh, in uh, in Gaza uh, by means of uh, Hamas and other groups, uh, Palestine Islamic Jihad and so forth. Um, so the, it's, it's quite an urgent question. And uh, the, the simplest way to put the question, which is the only way Washington frames questions, <laughs> I can tell you that, as I'm constantly reminded by my Israeli friends, uh, is whether the, um, uh, is, is whether the the dramatic uh, aftermath of the elections uh, will wind up presenting opportunities for the United States or, um, or the opposite, whether it will uh, prove to be uh, a very unfortunate turn of events uh, for U.S. foreign policy. And basically the two schools of thought uh, run, uh, run like this, uh, the optimistic view is that um, is that the regime was was taken aback by the scope and intensity of the protests following the election? They really didn't expect this. Um, having suppressed the uh, the opposition, at least for the time being, on this view, the uh, the regime will be feeling uh, somewhat vulnerable. And, and somewhat isolated, and they'll want to redeem themselves, give themselves some breathing space. And the best way to do that uh, would be by uh, responding positively to the U.S. administration's offer of dialogue, 
that uh, from an Iranian perspective, from the regime's perspective, this would be, of course, just a tactical maneuver, but an important one because it would buy them some breathing space. And uh, again, on this, on this optimistic view, a clever American administration could um, uh, use this as a wedge, could get inside uh, Iranian uh, decision-making, as it were, and turn what might originate as a purely tactical, um, somewhat defensive maneuver, maneuver on the part of the regime into something um, uh, more robust, something that could yield uh, greater dividends uh, for American interests. So that's the positive view. The, uh, the, the negative view is, uh, the pessimistic view, is essentially the opposite. And uh, briefly, it would go something like this. Here you have a regime that has demonstrated uh, the intensity of its commitment to uh, maintain and consolidate its power. And they will see themselves as having done so actually pretty easily. And not only that, but having done so without really very much uh, international opposition. I mean, and there really hasn't been all that much dyspepsia. Um, so th on this view, the Iranians will be feeling, the regime rather, will be feeling, uh, you know, very good about things and therefore um, feel especially um, fireproofed against international pressure, particularly American pressure to engage in dialogue or um, uh, to make uh, concessions, especially in the nuclear arena. And um, on this view, all one has to do to come to this conclusion is extrapolate uh, from uh, uh, statements made by uh, the regime, in particular by Khamenei and uh, Ahmadinejad, before the election. And they would say, well, a fortiori, you know, Kalva Homer, after this election, uh, they're just, they're going to be feeling really, really great. So uh, that's, those are the questions that are now facing uh, uh, the White House in Washington, and they're playing this in a very, very cautious way, as many people have, um, uh, have observed. And even in the President's uh, recent press conference, uh, which followed hard upon the heels of uh, rather heavy criticism, particularly from the right, uh, regarding his reticence about the violence that had taken place in Iran. In this press conference, he was still fairly reticent and took um, a somewhat agnostic posture on the question of um, the degree of election fraud, you know, saying that, well, we really don't know uh, very much of what went on. And of course, knowing the inter American intelligence community as I do, I can believe that they don't know anything. Um, uh, that was just, uh, I was being snide. Um, anyway, uh, just a couple of uh, closing um, observations. Uh, one is that if the pessimistic trajectory is the one uh, that events will follow, then American pressure on Iran will ultimately be increased, will be ratcheted up in the form uh, of legislation that is now brewing in, uh, in Congress, uh, particularly in the House of Representatives. And uh, this puts me in mind of the 1990s when there was a similar phase in U.S.-Iran uh, uh, relations and legislation similar to that which is um, uh, brewing now in Congress was passed. There was the Iran-Libya Sanctions Act, which extended extraterritorial U.S. authority over um, uh, financial transactions between third countries and Iran relating to its oil industry. There was the Iran Liberation Act, which um, uh, was uh, – which paid for Xerox machines, you know, on which anti-regime tracts could be published and all that. But the Iranians took all this very seriously. 
And during the 1990s, they played a cat and mouse game, attempting to strike out against the United States to deter it from going further. Ultimately, they launched an attack that succeeded, and that was at Cobar in 1996. Things quieted down just after that because, if you recall, in the following year, um, uh, Hatami was elected uh, 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 president, and uh, that gave the American administration uh, the opportunity. That gave the Amer American administration the breathing space to, uh, to back down. But if past is prologue, then we might be entering a phase in which Iran will lash out as it did in the 1990s. And if it were to do so, it would greatly complicate uh, the administration's foreign policy and possibly lead um, to escalation. So in sum, uh, uh, all I can uh, really share with you is a view that um, uh, we're looking into some very uh, dangerous uh, and risky uh, times in the wake of this election. Thank you. And uh, I suggest you move now to uh, Professor Dana Alin, because I think that I may also ask you, uh, as part of your expertise, is the transatlantic uh, issues that you also fit Europe into this uh, equation. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll write that down. <laughs> okay. Um, I've made a note. <laughs> Well, I was going to, I, I will get to that uh, very briefly, but I, unless I run out of time in my 10 minutes. But, um, well, first of all, thank you, David, for inviting me um, to join this panel. Um, I, I, I also want to speak uh, for my few minutes uh, about some of the aspects of the American uh, response um, to the stolen, apparently stolen election and, and sort of the green, green uh, rebellion and response. But... Uh, Maybe I can uh, touch on a slightly different level um, and presumptuously talk about the moral aspects of, um, or the, of, of, of the American quandary now or of the Obama quandary. Um, I mean, um, uh, David Menashri um, expressed, I think, some mild disappointment um, at, at if, if I or intimated some mild disappointment at um, uh, President Obama's rather restrained reaction, um, but did so, I think, in a, in a very uh, sensible and reasonable way. There is, of course, a much different, a much uh, more vehement discourse in the United States, states which Steve has uh, alluded to. It's a rather predictable discourse. Obama has been attacked um, on uh, sort of repeatedly on the 24-hour news cycle for um, standing on the wrong side of history. I mean, people like John McCain have, have gone at, at him, many of the sort of conservative uh, punditocracy. There was an interesting response, I thought, from, um, from John Chait in, in The New Republic, which, as, as many of you know, The New Republic is, has, is not distinguished by its very dovish or pro-Iranian, or for that matter, pro-Arab um, attitudes. Um, but John Chait um, looked at much of the criticism that's been directed against Obama, and he, he had, it's just a blog post in which he said, which was uh, titled, Will the Conservatives Please Attempt an Argument? And what he meant by that was that he found it astonishing that, um, I mean, he conceded, you know, the question of what, public position the president should take on these matters is a, is a difficult question. It's a debatable one. Um, it seems on the one hand that there has been an effort by, um, by the opposition in Iran to really, really mark out their um, autonomous, um, independent, Iranian nationalist uh, credentials and, for that matter, um, Islamic credentials. Um, and that would seem to lend support to Obama's position that we, you know, overt American uh, support could be counterproductive. Uh, but he's conceded, you know, we don't really know. It could, it could be the other way. But what he said, what he found incredible was that all these people were writing lengthy uh, diatribes, op-ed articles um, going on at great length 
without even acknowledging or addressing this argument of Obama's, which is that, you know, well, I could do, actually do more harm than good, um, which is um, without addressing his, and he said, how, you know, it, it escapes my, I just don't understand, I'm quoting Chait, I, I, I just don't understand how you can write a whole op-ed attacking somebody's argument without even, you know, acknowledging the argument, without even mentioning it. But I think, you know, I go into this because, just to say, I think that Obama clearly is sincere and believes that he could make matters wor worse um, and that his per perhaps his first uh, position should be to do no harm. Now, as you know, as the repression has become more savage, he has, um, he has uh, spoken uh, more, 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 um, more clearly and more um, eloquently um, without, however, as Steve said, actually taking sides in the actual question of whether the election was actually stolen. Um, having said all this, and you know, this was, I think, you, you can interpret this rightly as my defense of, of, of the Obama administration, I think there's no question that the administration has been wrong-footed by this crisis. Um, and it, you know, it had a plan. It, no one can say it was a, um, I mean, a certain a foolproof plan by any means, but it had a plan, and this plan has been upset. And the question is where does it go from here? And Steve has, has referred to this, but I mean, I, it has been a hallmark of, of Obama as a, and of course we, own, we mainly know President Obama as a candidate for President of the United States, and but we saw a lot of him in, in, that, in, 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 in that position. And one thing we learned about him is that he believes that he should set a strategic direction and stick to it. He doesn't believe uh, I mean, this seems to be, you know, odd, the, it may be odd to think, to imply that you can take, move, you know, campaign strategy to global strategy, but I mean, it does seem to be a, a, a personal attribute that he, um, he thinks it's a mistake to get pushed too easily off course by a criticism or, as he likes to say, the 24-hour news cycle in the United States. So I would surmise or speculate that to the extent possible, Assuming, um, assuming th th that the regime essentially wins this fight, that he will try, he will try to continue his policy of engagement. And the question is, is this now going to be at a moral price that is too high, hard to pay? And I think that's a serious question that's hard to answer. I think there's a hint to, of what his answer would be in uh, also something that happened in the campaign. It was actually, in retrospect, probably a key moment uh, in Obama's securing the nomination. Um, and that was, uh, you, many of you may recall this, that there was a YouTube debate in the United States where he was asked, um, I think, I didn't see it actually, but I mean, it's been discussed many times. He, uh, one of the um, questioners through a YouTube clip asked him, um, would he be ready to meet any time, you know, meet without preconditions with a sort of rogues gallery of, of American antagonists, including, including the president of Iran? And he said, yes, without preconditions. And his staff immediately, well, you know, his staff heard him say this, and they said, okay, well, this is a problem. Um, we're going to have to, you know, we're going to have to talk him out of this. I mean, talk, you know, talk our way out of this. We're going to ex explain what he really meant. Um, and so this was, the, this, this was the headline they expected the next day and that they would have to somehow neutralize. Um, and Obama heard, you know, wasn't really, he was sort of, they, they were having this conversation and he sort of heard it and he said, wait a minute, you know, you guys are, you know, you know don't, don't be so defensive. Um, I mean, there's no, you know, this was impromptu. There's no evidence that, that his remarks were planned really. But he said what, um, he said to his, his campaign aides what, um, I think he said many times in public sense, which was that, you know, we spoke to much more dangerous adversaries without preconditions. We spoke to the Soviets. Nixon's opening uh, to Mao's China, uh, which is considered one of the great acts, still considered, even though Nixon is not considered a, necessarily a, a great statesman, uh, well, not considered one of our greatest presidents, but it's considered one of the great acts of, of American s strategic uh, strategic savvy of the 20th century, um, and it came at a time, you know, when Mao had been pres had presided over a cultural revolution of, 
of, of frenzied brutality and, and, and venality. Um, so I think he really, really you know, he, he sees himself in the tradition of American foreign policy of, of doing what's necessary. Um, but, you know, to repeat, uh, so all I'm saying is the fact that, you know, the ugliness of what's happened in Iran I don't think would necessarily uh, deter him from trying to pursue a course that he finds strategically rational and sensible and in American interests uh, and in the interests of our allies. Um, and, you know, maybe he, I think he probably believes ultimately in the Iranians' interest, the Iranian people's interest. But as I say, we've all been wrong-footed by, by this crisis. It's very hard to make predictions. Um, you see quotes from administration officials saying that this will be very difficult. Um, I've been, um, I, of course, the other aspect of uncertainty is I've been sort of speaking implicitly on the assumption that the Green, uh, you know, this Green Rebellion will be successfully pre repressed. Um, I have no idea if that's true. As Sharam Shubin uh, intimated, that if, if, if the opposite happens, that would change everything. Okay, I wrote the word transatlantic down here. Um, <laughs> I think that, um, uh, well, I mean, I, <laughs> all joking aside, I haven't very closely followed the European reaction. It is interesting um, that, from what I understand, some European leaders, Sarkozy, um, uh, Miliband have have responded uh, with uh, a stronger moral position, uh, moral, um, and I don't think there's anything necessarily terribly surprising about that because the states, state, I mean, the, you know, the main strategic game is not in their hands, and it might represent, uh, and, and it's not surprising from the Europeans in the sense that um, I mean, you 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 see this sometimes on other analogous situations like China policy. Uh, I think somebody in our earlier, in a, maybe it was Sharam in our earlier uh, workshop mentioned uh, the Europeans and the Dalai Lama. Um, so um, I, I, Europe, 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 in my view, has considerable normative um, power. I mean, it's not no more than the United States do they have the ability to change the course of events in Iran. Uh, but and, uh, the... Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm curious about the – we had some discussion about why Britain was singled out um, as an object of such anger um, by, I guess, the supreme leader. And one of the answers is I think that the um, um, you know, BBC Persian service is an absolutely remarkable institution and force for um, enlightenment in the world. complex situation. I have to remind all of us that we are in the middle of a process that we don't know where it's leading. And uh, uh, I think that there's uh, no better person that can uh, if continue from the assembly to conclude this, this part before we go to our discussion. And, uh, Steve, uh, Steve Miller uh, is the last and uh, I think we still have some aspects that have not come. <laughs> Uh, well, thanks, uh, David. I join my colleagues, and thank you for in including me in this uh, event. I'm always delighted to uh, participate in the activities of the Center for Iranian Studies. Uh, Steve uh, Simon uh, gave, I would guess, 40, maybe 50 percent of the remarks that I prepared to give. I quickly and I thought brilliantly came to the conclusion <laughs> that I should focus on the other 50 percent of my <laughs> remarks. <laughs> Uh, then Dana spoke, so I'm still <laughs> I'm still scanning through my notes uh, uh, for what's left standing. Uh, but what I would I thought I would talk a little bit about is this Obama push for engagement, where it ca came from, what what it's meant, what purpose is it meant to serve, and what its fortunes may be, broadly speaking. Uh, Obama prides himself on being a practical guy, and he's famously described and universally described now as pragmatic. So then the question is, why does he think engagement is, is a pragmatic uh, idea and useful in, in the context of Iran? And I would say there, there are two factors which, which make uh, an engagement policy or an engagement strategy, if you want to uh, give it a grander label, uh, worth attempting. Uh, the first is that Iran's cooperation is thought desirable and possibly even necessary 
as the United States extricates itself from the mess we're in in Southwest Asia. We've got ourselves bogged down in two wars. Neither of them has gone particularly well. The brunt of American ground force power has been sopped up and, and consumed and, and also worn out uh, in these wars. The American taxpayer has spent now in excess of $1 trillion trying to pacify these places. We're years into both of these wars, uh, and neither of them looks like a, a glorious triumph, uh, even if uh, many of the worst uh, outcomes, uh, particularly in Iraq, seem to have been avoided. So how can we get ourselves out, limit our liabilities, uh, do so responsibly, and minimize the adverse aftermath? And the thought is that collaboration with Iran, whose interests overlap considerably with ours, in both Iran and Iraq, sorry, in both Iraq and Afghanistan, is desirable. And uh, Ambassador Holbrook, who has the Afghanistan account, is by all accounts uh, a great champion of trying to achieve some sort of diplomatic breakthrough with Iran because he thinks that this will facilitate the successful and effective handling of his docket. So that's reason number one, that we could use some help in getting nicely out of Southwest Asia without too much adverse consequence. The second uh, reason why engagement is thought an experiment worth attempting, in my opinion, is because uh, we've spent, the U.S. government has spent the better part of 20 years searching for an effective strategy to cope with the Iranian nuclear program. This did not start with Bush, but it intensified under Bush. Uh, and what we have to say is what we've done so far has not worked. It's as simple as that. Uh, the uh, Bush administration had one principal goal vis-a-vis -vis the Iranian nuclear program, and that was to prevent Iran from having an enrichment capability. And today, Iran has 7,000 installed centrifuges and counting. Uh, they have a capacity uh, to produce 50. With 4,000 centrifuges, you can produce 50 kilograms of highly enriched uranium a year. That's a bomb's worth or more, even with a simple weapons design. Uh, they have produced 350 tons of uranium hexafluoride, which is the feedstock that goes into their centrifuges. This is all taken right of, out of the IAEA reports from the inspections that uh, happen regularly. Uh, they have produced 1,250 kilograms of low enriched uranium and counting. Uh, so our clear, simple, unambiguous goal was not achieved. Uh, and what was the policy that failed to achieve our goal? It was a policy starting in Clinton and then intensified and pursued even more relentlessly under, under Bush of trying to isolate, sanction, and coerce Iran. If it had worked, fine, but it has not worked. So uh, the administration has tossed engagement into the mix as part of this ongoing struggle to find a way to maximize our interests vis-a-vis uh, these two uh, domains in which Iran plays such a central role. Now, one has to say that if you're fair to the administration, uh, they have not expressed extravagant hopes for this engagement policy. Uh, when Hillary went to the Gulf and was asked about uh, the Iran engagement policy, she said, uh, I don't think it has much prospects for success, but we're going to try it, uh, more or less in so many words. So this is not... Uh, this is not a set of people, I think, who has great delusions or, or uh, is entering this uh, process with a huge amount of naivete, uh, but they do think that maybe uh, we can advance our interests uh, by weaving this uh, into, the, into the mix. Now, it was never clear that this approach would, would work, uh, even before the current political crisis uh, in Iran, uh, but the notion, I think, was Given our stakes, right, both the United States and Israel have, have uh, insisted publicly, uh, repeatedly, and in the most urgent terms, that an Iranian nuclear weapons capability, or even uh, less than that, the infrastructure to produce nuclear weapons, poses an intolerable threat to our interests. Uh, if you believe that, then you ought to be able, you ought to be willing to try very hard and to, uh, to utilize whatever instrument might enable you to uh, prevent that outcome. And furthermore, if you really believe that you're facing something akin to an existential threat, then you ought to be willing to pay a very high price in diplomacy 
uh, and inducements in order to stop that program. Uh, and uh, so I think what you see in Obama's statements is very clear indication that he's going to try or had the hopes of trying to package a set of inducements with some uh, threatened improved sanctions in such a way that the inducement side looked attractive uh, and that we might made, make better headway than we've made uh, in the past. Uh, now uh, what we have is uh, the Iranian election. Uh, the possibilities in Iran have been very uh, well articulated by Steve Simon. Uh, my own uh, instinct, but uh, I know less than these other gentlemen about Iran, is that uh, uh, in past periods when Iran got absorbed in its own internal political agonies, that it tended to shut down to the outside world and that this was not a good time for engagement and diplomatic interaction, which Steve has sketched the alternative argument. Uh, President Obama has made one comment that I think didn't get much uh, attention, but I think was very important. At one point early in this crisis, he said, you know, our interest in preventing an Iranian bomb persists no matter what happens in, in that country. Uh, no matter how it goes, we don't want Iran to have a bomb, and we want them to have as little nuclear capability as possible. And I think implicit in that was the point I think Dana was trying to make, which is this is a man who thinks strategically uh, and who's not easily deflected from what he thinks is the best path toward the achievement of our interests. But what I would say in the, on the American side, as opposed to the Iranian side, uh, that there's, uh, in my opinion, no doubt that Obama's uh, hopes of pursuing an engagement uh, policy uh, have been uh, made more difficult by this crisis. The Congress is revved up. There's a bunch of uh, additional sanctions bills before the Congress. The punditocracy is all frizzed up, and he's, as Dana said, he's getting attacked uh, by left and, and right. Uh, there's a considerable residual anti-Iranian sentiment in the American body politic. Uh, and there, is, there are these kind of difficult moral and normative questions of how do you engage in diplomacy with a regime that has just uh, rigged an election and crushed uh, dissent in the street. Uh, those are very difficult uh, challenges for a guy who had a tough uh, road uh, in any case. Uh, we didn't know even before uh, these latest, this latest crisis in Iran how much interest there was in Iran in serious diplomacy, whether there was any serious interest uh, in diplomacy. Uh, the, the overtures so far from Washington have been met with kind of, at best, a lukewarm and cautious response. Ahmadinejad has said on multiple occasions uh, that, that Iran will not negotiate the nuclear issue with anyone other than the IAEA. Uh, and on the American side, you have uh, the difficulties of uh, transition, uh, lots of jobs still unfilled, an administration that's distracted by an array of other problems, including a massive economic crisis, which is probably consuming 80 percent of the president's time. You have an administration that, in my opinion, is still divided on the question of Iran uh, with respect to some very basic questions about what should our objectives be in, in negotiations and so on. So even before this crisis, I think uh, it was a tough uh, not to crack, uh, to pursue this engagement policy, and now we've had this additional dislocation of a major internal political crisis uh, in Iran. So I conclude by uh, simply noting that uh, if the engagement path is foreclosed, uh, we are forced to recur to a set of policies which so far over a very long period of time and despite very strenuous implementation, particularly by the Bush administration, simply have not worked. Thank you. Uh, so, okay. I, I want to thank the uh, uh, speakers here and open it to uh, questions, comments. Uh, I want to ask if this being uh, online, uh, to, our in, to the internet, if you people who want to uh, speak, uh, come here and speak. Uh, uh.
I suppose first I want to thank the panelists which, uh, for taking the time at the end of a long day uh, to share their thoughts with us. Um, my question is regarding, uh, I guess, if we can go back 10 days before the elections, the International Crisis Group issued a very interesting report on um, Iranian perceptions on a potential U.S.-Iranian uh, dialogue. It was a 25-page report, and it was probably the most in-depth report I've seen in print regarding what uh, people in Iran might be thinking regarding the Iranian regime's uh, interest in entering into a dialogue with the U.S. And at the end of the report, the International Crisis Group concluded that from the U.S. side, the U.S. might be willing to reach a deal with Iran that includes some sort of um, symbolic minimum enrichment on Iranian soil, but that was still a far cry from what Iran might be looking for in a potential deal with the U.S., which would include a substantial and very real uh, enrichment program on Iranian soil, which would come under some sort of international supervision. Um, so, I, so I think if we take the best case scenario which is, uh, for, for U.S.-Iranian dialogue, which is by far a, a best case, and meaning that the regime manages to consolidate its power, the U.S. is still willing to enter into a, such a negotiation with the regime, it seems like there still will be substantial gaps between uh, a potential um, deal between the U.S. and Iran. And I, and I just wanted to get sort of the reaction, um, I guess, from the three panelists who've discussed that issue today. Um, and my second question, I suppose, is for uh, Steve Simon, and it's with respect to Dennis Ross. Um, we heard recently uh, that he has shifted from the State Department to the National Security Council in the White House, and I wanted to know if that had any meaning or import for a potential U.S.-Iranian policy, uh, U the, the potential U.S. policy regarding Iran. Um, or whether it just represents, as Steve pointed out, uh, some, I, I guess, um, ambiguity regarding what the U.S.'s administration's policy is regarding a dialogue with Iran. Sorry for the extended question. <laughs> For me, it's very, very important part, uh, part in this. And uh, I, I think that Europeans have, uh, at least I believe, they should have more moral muscles to, to, to prove here that they, 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 they can really, they, they do care about certain issues going on in Iran. And uh, I know that, that I mentioned earlier in another occasion today that when there was one case that Europe, uni uh, uh, in a unified move, pressured Iran in April two, 1997, returning all its ambassadors from Tehran because of this, this uh, uh, Mykonos trial and the verdict of the Berlin court, this was a very impressive move and really pressured Iran. And I was reminded of it again yesterday when I heard Shirin Abadi suggesting with, with a Nobel Prize in, from Tehran, suggesting to the Europeans to take similar steps towards Iran. So I think in this sense, I think not much has, has, been, has been done. 
And finally, again about President Obama, I think Iran has been a very tough issue for the Iranian presidents. Some, some lost their position at re-election because of these Iran issues. They just mentioned uh, Carter as one of them. Uh, and uh, Iran, uh, United States interfered twice or did not interfere. There were two major Caucasians in America. Was, uh, his, its position was very important uh, towards domestic developments in Iran. One was in 1953 that Americans intervened, and it was a disaster. And the second time was in 1978 that the Americans did not intervene. I don't want to say good or bad, but I think that it's being remembered by many Iranians that the American administration did not, uh, did not really uh, interfere to save the Shah, that they, they worked closely with them. Certainly, everyone in the state or in position of Obama will think twice what to do with this issue. Now, if you have two of these kind of uh, examples, uh, so what will be the next, the next attitude. No matter what I think Amer Americans will do, they will be blamed for what's going on in, in Iran. And I think that they are already being, if you read the Iranian press and Iranian, uh, every, everything is being blamed on Americans, uh, they do them a favor and blame more the uh, Brits on uh, the, the Britain about, uh, about these issues. Now, my question will be is, is the following. Now, let's say that everything stays like it is today. Uh, how it's going, the experience of the last four weeks, two weeks before the election of these festivities of democracy and two weeks after the elections, how they are going to change the attitude of the outside world towards uh, this Iranian nuclear program and engagement with Iran? I offer you to... Start wherever you want, and you can also comment. Okay, I know that Sharon wanted to say something about things that have been raised before, so we have to comment on each other's uh, statements, since you are welcome to do it. Perhaps well, because I'm closest, I can start. Uh, just very briefly, it seems to me that um, this government has won an election, it, it insists, by a two thirds majority, which presumably uh, endorses the policies of this government. And one of the policies of this government is to say that the nuclear file is closed, that the nuclear program is like a train without brakes. So I'm not sure exactly, and as somebody else said, uh, that if there's any negotiation, it's between Iran and the IAEA, not between Iran and the US, which, which is, in their view, a political issue. So it seems to me unlikely, to put it mildly, that they will change their position and, and, and uh, turn around 180 or 360 degrees. Having said that, there is another aspect. Engagement as a policy was intended to slow down, uh, stop, and even perhaps eventually to reverse the nuclear program. But it wasn't the only thing. Engagement was also, I think, should have been anyhow, a strategy in which you engage Iran in order to open it up to increase discussion and eventually to see change and evolution in the system. Now, in many ways, engagement was seen by the hardliners in Iran as an opening to their demise. It could be argued, I'll just put it on the table, that having eliminated, as they have virtually eliminated, the reformists, politically eliminated and physically in some cases, presumably well, that will come next, they may feel reassured enough to in fact reverse themselves because there will be no domestic critics about what they're doing if they seek to change policy tactically or strategically vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. to come to an arrangement. There will be no pressure groups in the country saying, why didn't you do this four years ago? They will have been eliminated. So that's a very different uh, reading from the first one, where I suggested they might continue exactly the same way uh, that their program. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you can move it as you please. Where else do you? you had a specific question. Um, the, it, the president makes Iran policy, uh, not Dennis Ross or any other official uh, for that matter. Um, and, uh, you know, all, all I can tell you about um, uh, Dennis Ross's move to the White House is that uh, the president uh, desired it. 
so so he made the move. But um, you know, as far as policy making is concerned, as we've been discussing for the past hour or so, the situation uh, in Iran is extremely fluid. Uh, as uh, Dana and Steve Miller both pointed out, the plans that the administration had brought uh, to the Iran uh, uh, portfolio, um, uh, you know, necessarily have to be adjusted uh, in the wake of this event. So I really think it's too early to say um, uh, how and what form this adjustment will take. Um, and uh, with respect to Dennis Ross, all one can say is he's, he's going to be a senior advisor um, on these questions uh, to the president. Uh, I'd like to make three quick points. Uh, first, with respect to Iran and this idea that they will only talk to the IAEA, uh, Iran committed a series of uh, unquestioned and admitted safeguards violations for a very long period of time. Uh, they were in the realm of failures to report or declare materials, activities, and facilities. Uh, when they got uh, revealed red-handed uh, they acted consistent with the statute of the IAEA and issued changed declarations to the IAEA. There's a formal process uh, which uh, remedied the breaches of their safeguard violations. So the activities that got Iran in trouble in the first place were, in fact, uh, repaired. Uh, then there was a second family of issues uh, having to do with uncertainties and unresolved questions that the world and the IAEA had about the past undeclared Iranian nuclear activities. Uh, the IAEA has been looking into this intensively since October of 2003. Uh, in the summer of 2007, uh, they uh, negotiated with Iran and agreed work plan to identify the five remaining unresolved questions uh, and to work systematically through them. And uh, if you read the IAEA report uh, uh, of the Secretary General to the IAEA Board of Governors of February 2008, uh, what you will see is that uh, virtually every remaining question was declared resolved. Uh, and th so this is what the Iranians mean by the nuclear dossier is closed, because a lot of the technical claims against them uh, uh, have, in fact, been uh, uh, closed out, uh, and uh, none of that uh, satisfied uh, the world that was concerned about a broader pattern of circumstantial evidence and suspicious activities that suggested an interest in a weapons program, but that's where that, that comes from. Uh, and the, uh, the final point to make under this heading is that uh, enrichment is a permitted activity. <laughs> Uh, it's not forbidden by the, I, by the NPT. It's not forbidden by the safeguards agreements. Uh, and the, uh, the only legal prohibitions on the Iranian enrichment program are, in fact, the UN Security Council resolutions, which the United States regards as illegitimate politicized documents that are uh, – what did I say? United States. Uh, Iran regards these as <laughs> illegitimate uh, – uh, <coughs> politicized documents that are a byproduct of sustained and intense American pressure. So uh, that's where all that comes from. Uh, Brendan raised the question of uh, how much enrichment uh, should be permitted on Iran's soil. Uh, for the longest time, we have sat on a position of zero enrichment. Uh, that is, that was the goal of the, of the uh, Bush administration. It was the goal also of the Clinton administration, which worked very hard to prevent Iran from getting any of these capabilities. Uh, and from the nonproliferation point of view, I'm a nonproliferation wonk by, by training. Zero is the preferred outcome in the desired world. Uh, I'm opposed to any spread of national enrichment capabilities. I thought we made a mistake in not also opposing the Brazilian 
uh, enrichment facility, which was built simultaneously with the Iranian and is now uh, fully functioning. Uh, but uh, we're now to the point where insisting on zero enrichment at a point where Iran has 7,000 centrifuges is enriching, is adding a thousand or more centrifuges a year, uh, is moving from primitive P1 centrifuges to more uh, sophisticated and uh, efficient P2 centrifuges, it seems to me that maybe the horse is out of the barn. Uh, and if you can't get the ideal outcome, then the question is, uh, how can you minimize the proliferation risks of the capabilities that Iran already possesses and, and many people, including me, think is not likely to give up? Uh, one set of creative uh, uh, attempts to find an answer involves multinationalization of one sort or another. We have here in the audience uh, John Thompson and Jeff Forden, who are, have been among the most creative and the most relentless in trying to promote the idea of, uh, of uh, some sort of multinationalization of the Iranian capability, which satisfies their need for national pride and satisfies our need for uh, the maximum possible international constraints on, on their uh, enrichment. Uh, the, uh, the problem is that uh, there, as long as there is enrichment on Iranian soil, there's always a breakout scenario that you can imagine, and there's no perfect technical or safeguard solution to that. You would have warning, we would know, they couldn't do it covertly uh, using the facilities that we're aware of, but that would be uh, uh, always a risk, and that's one of the reasons why uh, in Washington today you still find many people who say we ought to stick with zero and do our best to achieve it because the alternative is to leave in the picture various worst-case breakout uh, scenarios. On Russia and China, uh, I would say uh, several quick things. They do not see Iran in the same way we do. The Americans, the Israelis, the Brits, maybe some of the others, some French, uh, see Iran as a very, an unusually dangerous and an unusually unpleasant regime that's kind of beyond the pale. Uh, the Russians and the Chinese see them as another thuggish third world country. Uh, they do big business. Uh, the Russians have supplied the reactor fuel for uh, Boucher. The fuel now sits in Iran. The Russians have been the principal providers of uh, arms to uh, Iran, including the supply of uh, missile of air defense equipment, literally simultaneously while they were negotiating sanctions uh, with Nick Burns, they were they were providing Iran with air defense equipment, some of which they had to know was meant to protect the the nuclear facilities. The Chinese, over the last four years, have signed in excess of 100 billion dollars. That's billion with a B uh, of uh, natural gas development contracts with the Iranians. It remains to be seen how many of those actually get fulfilled, but the, uh, the idea that uh, uh, they're isolated or the Chinese are, are uh, looking askance at Iran, I think, is, is uh, very misleading. A Chinese company is building the Tehran subway system. Uh, if you go to the uranium conversion facility at Isfahan, as several of us uh, here have had a chance to do, Every last item in that facility, including the screwdrivers, has Chinese characters stamped on the, on the side of them. Uh, so uh, do Russia and China want Iran to have a nuclear weapon? I don't think so. Is it in their interest to prevent it? Uh, yes, I think on balance that would be the better outcome for them. But is, there, is it their highest objective? No. Uh, are they prepared to sacrifice other major interests in order to achieve that outcome? I don't think so. Does it pose a large or existential threat to them? Not at all. Uh, so they see it very uh, differently. Uh, and I would say, as just as a last point, if you look at the sanctions diplomacy, uh, the, the policies of China and Russia turned out to be quite successful in the sense that they went along with just enough sanctions to get the Americans off their back uh, and not enough sanctions to, in any significant way, way dislocate their very ample and lucrative relationships with Iran. Um, we had a, um, we ha just to, I, I, 
I, I definitely agree with what Steve just said about, about Russia and China. I mean, it, it, no, they don't want uh, to see Iran as a nuclear weapon state, but it's just on their list of priorities at a far different place than it is on ours. And, I mean, this uh, harks back. We did have a, a, a rather interesting and an extended discussion of this in, in our, the separate workshop that we attended. And, you know, the point was made that essentially um, – for two, at least well, for two administrations, uh, not just the Bush administration, also the Clinton administration, there was a, an attitude towards Russia um, of, refu of, of not believing, either refusing or not believing it was necessary. I'm talking about the American attitude. Um, not believing it was necessary to ha have any priorities in our relationship with Russia, um, either because Russia was seen as too weak, which it was uh, for part of this time, uh, or because it was the assumption was that a democratic Russia would eventually, a, a democratic Russia will have to see, th will eventually see things the way we see them, and all we have to do is tell, to repeat it to them, you know, enough times and at a loud enough volume until they'll finally see the light. Um, so we told them. NATO enlargement is not a threat to your interests. Um, it is, it's good for you, in fact. It, 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 it stabilizes your border. And we've, you know, repeated this many, many times. Uh, somehow they're not getting the message. Um, missile defense installations in, uh, in um, uh, Poland and the, and the Czech Republic uh, you know, are obviously not a threat to Russia. I mean, they're intended for, you know, a, a putative Iranian uh, missile threat. Um, Russians, you know, come up with this crazy theory about how uh, the United States, um, with, even, with even a limited missile defense capability against Russia, could launch a first strike against Russia and then have missile defenses destroy enough of their arsenal so they'd have missile, and our missile defenses would prevent um, a um, Russian response. Uh, of course, that's crazy because why would the United States launch an unprovoked nuclear attack against Russia? I mean, that's, the, that's Cold War thinking. Um, that's the American attitude. But, you know, if the Russians would just consult um, the collected works of the Committee on the Present Danger, in the 19 that were published, there was uh, Alerting America. I still think I still have the volume, uh, which the Committee on the Present Danger included people like Paul Nitze, um, um, Pipes, um, various people like this. And um, I can assure you that there are extended extrapolations of scenarios uh, involving a Russian um, attack on the United States um, that are no less crazy than the Russian fear of our attack on them. So um, we have never, ever, ever felt that we had to prioritize, um, you know, have a list of priorities that we would actually talk to the Russians about, negotiate with them, um, decide whether their, co for example, is their cooperation in trying to prevent a nuclear Iran more important to us than bringing Georgia into NATO. That's a kind of discussion that has been, even posing the question is considered appeasement. You know, how can we sell out poor little Georgia uh, for this? But um, again, I mean, I think this is, a, is an area where you actually do see a remarkable change in worldview from the Obama administration that I think does realize that in relations with Russia, you have to start to make choices. Uh, the problem is it's probably too late. Um, to, uh, for this. Um, I just, the only other thing I would respond to, I mean, the relationship with China, of course, and our leverage over China is even uh, more problematic in, in the current financial crisis, but, I mean, that, that's, that, that's, a, that's a mutual leverage that works both ways, and I, anyway, I, I don't want to take any more time. Um, David, um, the only thing I would say, uh, you, you said, you suggest, I mean, the, the, of course, the advantage, one advantage the Europeans have is they have ambassadors in, in, in Iran, which they can withdraw. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, that, they can do that. Um, and uh, perhaps they should. Um, and they should do it over this, um, I mean, but the, the question will rise. Um, do they want to do it over this issue? Or do they want to do it, um, do they want to preserve leverage 
on the nuclear file. And um, that's an interesting trade-off, which I'm not sure how one would answer. You could argue that maybe uh, Europe is in a better, it can get more mile, bang for its buck out of, you know, pressure on moral issues rather than on a strategic issue, but I don't know how, how that would play. Um, uh, uh, you mentioned that uh, the limited leverage of power that Iran demonstrated in Iraq. Would it be because of Iranian lack of power or maybe the Shiite of Iraq is being more Iraqi or Arab than they are Shiites? At the end of the day, what takes the point? Uh, two things. On, on Sistani, it would strike me as un, unlikely, and it would strike me as running against his, his kind of historical position and his extreme caution and his, I think, careful – not uh, – certainly not – I think we have a very clear idea of what his position vis-a-vis -vis the ruling elite in Iran is, but we have that clear view through unclear means, and to send a – to send emissaries like that, I think, would be un unusual. <coughs> on, on lack of Iranian um, leverage, uh, I mean, in, in my own work, from the 20s onwards, but certainly from the 50s, you track a, 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 very, a rise of a very palpable, empirically testable Iraqi nationalism. Um, uh, you, people would maybe see 58 to 68 as a, a golden age of fluidity and possibility. But I'd actually argue 68 through the 80s to the 90s possibly is where Iraqi nationalism is severed from kind of what could be described as Ba'athist chauvinism. But Iraqi nationalism uh, is, is not a, a particularly um, nice thing. Uh, and given what happened to uh, Iraq during the Iran-Iraq war and then during sanctions, this is understandable. But it is, it is a palpable, visceral, somewhat xenophobic uh, ideology which, which it certainly deployed quite neatly against um, the United States, but quite strongly against Iran as well. Um, that a group like the Supreme Council could have so much influence in Iraq from 2003 to 2009 has much, much more to do with the vagaries, incompetences, and ideological blind spots of the United States than it does do with Iraq's Iraq Shia population. Uh, the Supreme Council has never been popular. Uh, never been particularly effective as a political organization, as we see finally when they get out from under the shadow of the United Iraqi Alliance. Just to add to that, my understanding is that Prime Minister Malik is coming under extreme pressure to rejuvenate the United Iraqi Alliance as a vote-winning coalition. And his answer to this, which speaks quite fascinatingly about Malik, is uh, put this comparative autonomy from Tehran is why? What's in it for me? Why should I do this? And I think the answer is because we can probably guarantee uh, in, in, not in, a, in an Iranian way, in an Iraqi way, we can guarantee the outcome of the elections, i.e., if you commit to, to, to joining the Iraqi, United Iraqi Alliance, you'll be Prime Minister again. Now, that's, let's spin this round. That's quite a, 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 quite a delightful dilemma for Soleimani and, and, and Iranian foreign policymakers towards Iraq, because if Maliki becomes Prime Minister again, his autonomy m massively increases. It's, it's only from March, April last year that we see a haphazard kind of last man standing prime minister suddenly, well not suddenly but very carefully and I think astutely concentrate power in his office. I, th I think he stands a good chance of winning the next elections if he does that. We find, I think, uh, that we have a much stronger possibility of a, uh, a kind of Putin-like figure, an elected dictator who is, is centralizing power and stabilizing the country in the name of a strong state the imposition of law and a strong nationalism. It's kind of back to the future for Iraq after you know, hundreds of thousands of deaths, billions of US dollars, and a, a foreign policy debacle that we'll be shaking our heads about till the next generation of foreign policy makers forget it. Uh, 
<coughs> thank you. I want to thank the uh, five panelists for two things. First, I don't remember when I was chairing a session in which I didn't have to remind the speaker that time is out. So I, I didn't have to use it, this prerogative ever uh, in, in the, to today. But more seriously, I think that we can go home with some uh, new ideas and thoughts, and I know that the situation in Iran is not yet uh, very clear, but I think that uh, is, as an interim conclusion, we can come up with some uh, ideas about uh, the impact of the situation on foreign players and vice versa from the outside into, into Iran. I know it was a very uh, busy day for our five <coughs> panelists here who have been all day in another seminar, and I'm so thankful for you for agreeing to participate here and sharing your knowledge and wisdom with us. Thank you very much. And finally, uh, people to thank me for inviting or so on. So usually, as a director, you get the credit for so many things, but I think that in this case, uh, most of the work has been done by Rachel, which is sitting here, did, uh, organizing the whole thing. Thank you very much, and, and see you in our uh, next activities. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.